Today's video is brought to you by Sheath Underwear. More on them in just a bit. It's early 1945 and the battle for the Philippines is in full swing. Allied troops under the command of General of the Army Douglas MacArthur have taken the islands of Leyte and Mindoro. This has created a critical staging area for their invasion of Luzon. Hundreds of thousands of American troops and Filipino guerrillas now swarm across the islands, beating back well-entrenched Japanese forces day after day. MacArthur's target is the city of Manila, capital and crown jewel of the Philippine Islands and the key to complete control of the archipelago. But Japan's military leaders are acutely aware of how desperately MacArthur wants Manila, just as they are aware that losing the city would bring the Japanese war effort to the brink. As far as Japan was concerned, Manila would be defended to the last. And when Allied troops arrived at the city, they found that out the hard way. In today's episode, uh, we're going to detail the Battle of Manila in all its detail, the strategic and tactical moves that led to the city's eventual capture, and the brutal human cost of the whole wretched affair. The Philippine Islands were ceded to Japanese occupation in March of 1942 after a brutal series of assaults that saw Allied forces pushed out of the region. Prior to the Second World War, the Philippines had been a rather warmly held American exclave, but between Japan's far greater military presence in South Asia and its all-consuming hunger for the island's precious resources, the islands had proven impossible for General MacArthur's forces to defend. Japan had been merciless in taking the islands, reducing them to a wasteland from the air and letting disease and starvation kill many Allied troops. But they'd also done a lot of the dirty work by hand. Stories ran rampant among the American and Filipino defenders of young GIs who had been disemboweled at close quarters with their own genitals cut off and stuffed into their mouths. And the city of Manila got it just as bad, occupied and ignored by the Japanese for three years, with its residents forced to starve while Japan's forces plundered it for anything that remained. Japan had little to no interest in overseeing the Philippine economy, instead hauling away any food, natural resources, and anything else of value that they could find. This put the people of Manila into a desperate situation. Grave robbing became common, as did brazen theft against the living, as well as forced labor, and in many cases, the sale of their own starving children. Filipino guerrilla fighters were able to continually get word out to the Allies about the conditions there, uh, which made it exceptionally clear to Allied leaders that the Philippines couldn't wait for liberation. Unlike many areas within the Pacific Theatre, the people of the Philippines remained supportive to the Allies for the most part, and the islands were also of huge strategic importance to whoever controlled them. And this was all before even acknowledging the many American soldiers still held captive on the islands, the same soldiers the country had been compelled to leave behind. The Allies would get their chance two years later, after turning the tide of the war at Midway and taking back a number of strategic islands of the Pacific. The US began airstrikes against Japanese targets in the Philippines almost as soon as they came into bomber range, softening any targets within reach, while New Guinea, Saipan, and Guam all fell under Allied control. At this time, the Japanese home islands were finally within reach, but Japanese forces in the Philippines provided a check on what the Allies could do with that advantage. Overextent in an attempt to capture the home islands and counterattack from the south, could make the Allies pay. But when early attacks probed the Philippines to see what kind of resistance they would find there, they were pleasantly surprised to see that the Japanese seemed hesitant to oppose their bombing runs. The situation in the skies, plus intelligence that indicated the Filipino people were ready for a fight, caused the Allies to ready the invasion plans for October 1944. The invasion was spearheaded by the US Army, a deliberate decision by General MacArthur to refuse the aid of the Marines despite their expertise in amphibious warfare. Instead, the Army would work in tandem with Filipino guerrillas who struck deep within the Japanese back lines and performed critical reconnaissance work. The island of Leyte served as an anchor point for the Allies, where the US Navy destroyed the last major holdout of the Japanese fleet. Next up were the islands of Samar and Mindoro. After being overrun, they were transformed into forward air bases to support the advance toward the key island of Luzon, where Manila is located. The capture of Mindoro allowed the Allies to establish air superiority in the region, and before long, most of the islands of Luzon had been captured. Both sides understood that Manila was the Allies' final objective in the Philippines. If Japan could hold it, they would maintain some level of ability to keep their hold on the South Pacific and to protect the home islands. If they couldn't, 
Then the Allies would be free to begin their endgame in the Pacific Theater, and Japan's calculus would have to change very very fast if it wanted to survive at all. So today I want to interrupt the video to talk about our incredible sponsor today, and that would be Sheath Underwear. And look, I know what you're thinking, Simon, so why are you talking about underwear on this channel? That's not what I'm here for, but look, hear me out. I have been wearing Sheath for, I think it's been a good couple of years now, and they are an absolute game changer. I'm wearing them, ooh. It says right there that I'm wearing them right now, but I know I'm not because I just got back for a tr from a trip and all my underwear went in the laundry and I had to wear some nasty old underwear and it's not very comfortable. So I'm sorry, Sheath, but I'm not. And I had this nice pair that I use for demonstrations on video that I've never worn because if I did the worn one, that would be weird. But uh, I'm pretty tempted to put these on to be honest. They are the absolute best underwear. They'll be the most comfortable box of briefs that you've ever put on your body. Look, summer is around the corner. Gets a little bit hot, gets a little bit sweaty down there, if you know what I mean. But since discovering Sheath, everything has just been easier. They've got this dual pouch system that keeps everything, you know what I mean, separate and cool. So uh, it keeps you cool. It keeps you fresh. And look, even if you're not into the whole dual pouch thing, that's fine too. Just pop them on like regular underwear. They're still very comfortable. Sometimes I find myself not using them, just wearing like regular underwear. It's perfect. They've also got new materials like bamboo and mesh for even more cooling comfort. So if you're tired of boxes that are too loose or briefs that are too tight, you need to try Sheath. Go to sheathunderwear.com and get the most comfortable underwear you've ever worn. If you use the code WARAGRAPHICS at checkout, you'll also get 20% off your order. Again, sheathunderwear.com, promo code WARAGRAPHICS for 20% off your order. Trust me, it's absolutely worth trying. You'll order one pair and then you'll just stored or more and now back to today's video The general in charge of the Japanese army in the Philippines, Tomoyuki Yamashita, had ordered a majority of his troops to withdraw to the city of Baguio. This was by no means a sacrifice of Manila, but instead an attempt to draw the Allies into a prolonged campaign across the northern part of Luzon in order to buy the home islands as much time as possible before what Yamashita considered to be an inevitable defeat in the Philippines. However, Rear Admiral Sanji Iwabuchi, technically a subordinate to Yamashita, refused to pull his own troops out of the city. Iwabuchi controlled some 12,500 Japanese marines under his command, plus another 4,500 army troops who Yamashita had allowed to stay and assist. As such, although Manila lacked any substantial air or naval capacity to defend itself, Iwabuchi's forces did the best they could with what they had. They barricaded many of the streets in Manila, blew up bridges and piers, dug in defenses for a protracted urban battle, and set up a runway to launch the limited numbers of aircraft that they did have. Despite their disagreements on what exactly to defend, Yamashita and Iwabuchi were in agreement that this would be their final battle, meant to buy as much time as possible. Yamashita issued his orders to his commanders prior to the battle, saying, It is easy to die with honor, but it is much more difficult to hold up the enemy advance when you are short of ammunition and food. Those of you in the front line will be doing your duty if you hold them up for a day, or even half a day. The Japanese defense of Manila was centered around the citadel of Intramuros, a historic walled section of the city with an easily defendable landscape. Each major building of the city was modified into its own miniature fortress, with barricades built not just from street to street, but room to room inside each building, such that any allied incursion into the buildings themselves would place them into a nearly unwinnable fight. The city was turned into a maze, mined to hell, and dug in with layers on layers of defense, while most of its fortified underground sections were turned into makeshift munitions factories to continue the fight. This was starkly contrasted by the attitudes of MacArthur prior to the battle, who was unshakable in his belief that Japan's forces would retreat from Manila entirely. Accurate intelligence from the Filipino guerrillas wasn't enough to change his mind, and as he was more personally interested in good press back home than a conclusive victory, MacArthur announced that Manila had been liberated by February 6th. In fact, by that point, there had hardly been any fighting at all, except for the liberation of thousands of prisoners of war at the Santo Tomas internment camp on the outskirts of the city. The battle was underway, and across Manila, Japanese soldiers blew their planted charges around major bridges, and American convoys began to fall into the carefully laid Japanese traps in the streets. Admiral Iwabuchi had ordered his planned destruction of any resources that could help the Americans once they were captured, including its water and electrical systems. Much of the city's civilian infrastructure was burned, and many Americans were forced to wage early skirmishes amidst vast firestorms. By the end of the first week, the lines within Manila were established. The Allies controlled the land north of the Pasig River and Japan controlled to the south. 
Of course, MacArthur had already declared victory by this point, but as news of an allied Philippine spread back home, MacArthur and his advisors became increasingly aware of the dangers of proceeding further. American artillery raids were unable to reliably discriminate between their targets and were ineffective in preventing the start of more fires in civilian districts. Soon after, the army made plans to cross the Pasig River, sweeping in toward Japanese forces from two directions, while paratroopers cut off a third angle to prevent escape. The river crossing uh, was fiercely resisted by Japanese defenders, but the Americans were able to establish a foothold in two city districts. The American forces were then faced with a difficult decision. By now, they were well aware that they were being lured into well-defended kill zones and the crosshairs of a legion of snipers. Proceeding further into the city would subject them to the meat grinds that Iwabuchi had organized, with Japan clearly willing to ensure the deaths of civilians even despite the Allies' best efforts. MacArthur realized that their careful advance was simply delaying the inevitable. At the start of the second week of battle, Allied command had captured enough records and other intelligence from the Japanese that they they could confirm the worst. There was no plan to withdraw from Manila ever. And with that sobering reality now fully understood, the Americans abandoned any pretense of protecting civilians by limiting the use of heavy weapons. Tanks and artillery were brought to bear against Japanese positions, and bomber and fighter support in the skies picked up substantially. With so many defenses inside Manila's buildings and on the streets, the safest way to get further into the city was to just level the defenses entirely. This decision had a tragic side effect. Any civilians trapped inside the buildings that the Allies attacked were often killed alongside the Axis troops. But of course, if the Allies had entered those buildings as the Japanese had hoped, then those civilians were likely intended to be used as human shields. This slow, urban grind lined up with the experiences of most of the army who would proceed for blocks without meeting any resistance and then find hundreds of Japanese troops crammed into a heavily fortified building that would take hours or even days to deal with. Often, these fortifications would be broken by infiltrations from a small handful of soldiers such as Clito Rodriguez and John Reese, two privates who killed some 80 or more Japanese soldiers in a Japanese rail station. The two would win the Medal of Honor for their actions, Reese posthumously. And theirs was not the only story of this kind. A simultaneous assault on the Manila Electric Company's power plant held on a fortified island within the city limits turned into a claustrophobic and deadly game of hide-and-seek that the Americans won after three days. And to the south, American troops found themselves wading into some thousand or more enemy pillboxes, camouflaged into the landscape, with the terrain covered by numerous angles of far, whilst being mine to hell. Some of the defenses even used massive naval guns, stripped off their warships and hauled onto land. In these cases, it was up to American artillerymen to clear a path for the infantry who would march forward and mop up any resistance that survived the bombardment. By this time, Admiral Iwabuchi had already fled the city for a fort on the outskirts in order to keep coordinating his troops in the face of encirclement. His soldiers and marines still inside the city began to understand that victory was impossible, a reality that drove them to fight more recklessly against the Americans and led them to completely disregard the lives of the civilians still within their control. Luckily for the Allied forces, General Yamashita's forces had been tied up outside the city, forced to contend with bombing runs on their positions. But even so, Admiral Iwabuchi's forces were doing exactly what they were supposed to do. They were buying time so that the home islands could be fortified. In the following week, the Allies continued to advance, destroying Japanese heavy artillery in Manila. They were also able to move inwards and liberate hospitals, universities, and neighborhoods, bringing tens of thousands of civilians to safety. In response, the Japanese used what light artillery they had to shell American positions, with an emphasis on attacking the centers where civilians were being held and processed. On the Japanese side, Admiral Iwabuchi made a surprise decision to return to Manila, both due to tactical fears that his command center outside the city would be overrun, and an apparent personal desire to meet his death with his troops. When Iwabuchi returned, he found the Japanese slaughter of civilians to be in full swing and seemed to take no issue with it. Instead, he oversaw the process as his defensive lines drew inward around the citadel at Intramuros, abandoning weapons caches, intelligence, and supplies to the American advance as he did so. But although Iwabuchi's remaining artillery could continue firing outward from a point of encirclement, the heavier, more sophisticated, more numerous American artillery pieces could now concentrate fire at a much smaller target. 
The building to building battles continued, with Japan's greatest points of success still coming in those close quarter engagements. Now, instead of giving ground at any reasonable pace, the Japanese troops were pushed inward enough that every fight was to the death, and every Molotov cocktail, every spool of barbed wire, and every unexploded piece of ordnance was damn well going to be used up before that death came. In return, the American troops grouped into small teams of 12 who would clear bombed out buildings with a mixture of shoulder rockets, flamethrowers, heavy explosives, rifles, and knives. With the ground completely saturated with shrapnel, detecting mines became nearly impossible to do via electronic means, and sniper fire prevented those mines from being dug out. As such, maneuvering tanks through the streets became unthinkable, meaning that unless American artillery pieces could destroy their targets from afar, the Japanese would finally get their hand-to-hand -hand battle that they wanted. With death closing in, Japanese forces outside the city got word to Admiral Iwabuchi that he was to attempt to break out in order to prolong the defense of the island while sacrificing Manila itself. Under this plan, five battalions outside the city would charge American lines and create a diversion, and while the Allies were distracted, Iwabuchi was to dedicate his entire force to a charge towards safety. But Iwabuchi refused to agree to the breakout. In part, his return transmission read, I am overwhelmed with shame for many casualties among my subordinates and for being unable to discharge my duty because of my incompetence. The men have exerted their utmost in the fighting. Now, with what strength remains, we will daringly engage the enemy. Banzai to the emperor. We are determined to fight to the last man. In a second transmission, he clarified exactly what he intended to do, to inflict severe losses on the enemy by any means necessary until every Japanese fighter in the city had perished. By the 20th of February, the Japanese forces had retreated almost fully into Intramuros. From the 20th to the 23rd, the Allied forces mopped up much of the resistance that still lay outside the citadel while stumbling on the site of massacre after massacre of civilians. Now the bulk of the Japanese force was concentrated inside the citadel and some government buildings nearby in an area of roughly one square mile. By now, the Japanese were down to their rifles, their grenades, and their bayonets. Concentrated into such a small area, they were sitting ducks for American heavy guns which rained hellfire down onto the fortress for days on end. Starting on the 23rd, the heavy guns would shell an area to pieces, and American infantry would then attempt incursions afterward in a cycle that now integrated attacks by land and via the shores of the Pasig River. On the American side, the advance was procedural, yet another stage of the brutal urban battles that they had become accustomed to. But now, if the Japanese defenders weren't wounded, they were drunk. And if they weren't drunk, they were deprived of sleep. And more likely than not, they were all three. As the Allies broke into Intramuros, they found fewer and fewer Japanese soldiers waiting to attack, and more who had taken their own lives. On the 26th of February, Admiral Iwabuchi and his inner circle of officers joined them, and after a week more, the Americans had won back Intramuros, foot by foot. On the 4th of March, Intramuros was declared clear of Japanese forces, and with it, Manila was declared liberated. But this understanding of the Battle of Manila, it only tells half the story, brutal as it already might be. What we've held off on really discussing thus far are the million civilians who were trapped inside the city during Japan's defense, many of them too weak from starvation to even consider defending themselves in the violence. It is the story of these innocents that forms the other side of the battle, as their beloved city was made apocalyptic by the Allies and the Axis alike. The people of Manila were aware of just how bad the battle would get, even before it began. Anyone in Manila who could fight had already attempted to flee to the countryside to join the guerrillas, and the Japanese troops fortifying the city were well aware of their intent. Prior to the battle, many Filipinos were disappeared if they dared venture far from their homes, while others were pressed into forced labor. In the first days of the assault, Japanese soldiers rounded up suspected guerrilla fighters in their back lines as well as their families, men, women, children, including infants were slaughtered. The fire set by Japanese forces spread rapidly throughout the city, burning many of the homes that had survived thus far and killing and displacing thousands more. 
In Ichimuras, Japanese troops locked down a perimeter to prevent civilians from escaping and began a systematic campaign of rape against young women that would later spread throughout the city. As the American assault wore on, Japanese snipers took to the rooftops and the windows of Manila, taking pot shots at any civilian who dared to leave cover. As the Japanese Marines began to get a clearer idea of how the American advance would progress through individual city blocks, they took to burning homes with far greater precision, often setting them alight with people still inside. If any men ran out and attempted to escape, they would be killed, while their families were left displaced and risked death as well. No one was immune from being targeted, as revealed by orders from the Japanese military itself to quote, Even women and children have become guerrillas. All people on the battlefield, with the exception of Japanese military personnel, Japanese civilians, and special construction units, will be put to death. All people on the battlefield. And make no mistake, the entire city of Manila was the battlefield. The instructions Japanese troops received were just as precise. To quote, when Filipinos are to be killed, they must be gathered into one place and disposed of with the consideration that ammunition and manpower must not be used to excess. Because the disposal of dead bodies is a troublesome task, they should be gathered into houses which are scheduled to be burned or demolished. They should also be thrown into the river. This quote is from an order issued by the Manila Naval Defense Force. Not only were civilians to be killed, but they were to be killed indiscriminately, and they were to be killed through the slow and agonizing means of fire, blades, asphyxiation, and drowning. For all the Japanese soldiers cared, both they and the people of Manila were already dead. There were no rules. There was nothing left to save. From this point, the rape of Manila truly began, with many accounts of Japanese soldiers gleefully orchestrating booby traps and needlessly elaborate massacres at a horrific pace. Stories abounded of those same soldiers singling out young children, even infants, and laughing as they killed those children with knives and bayonets in front of their helpless parents. Women were raped in the thousands, with their captors completely unconcerned with even their most basic physical safety. As one Japanese participant in the massacres told the New York Times after the fact, quote, In the beginning, we could not kill even a man, but we managed to kill him. Then we hesitated to kill a woman, but we managed to kill her, too. Then we could kill children. We came to think of it as if we were just killing insects. It was a story that matched prior massacres by the Japanese military at Nanking and elsewhere, but on a staggering scale. 100,000 innocent civilians were confirmed to be killed in the violence, with an additional 150,000 injured. Altogether, the civilian casualties came out to a quarter of Manila's entire population at that time, by bayoneting, shooting, bombing, burning, live burial, beheading, and torture. Japan's marines and soldiers ensured that the people of Manila would not survive to be liberated, just as they themselves did not intend to live long enough to be defeated. Frankly, look, we could spend far longer cataloging the countless war crimes Japan perpetrated during this battle, but for the sake of our collective ability to sleep at night, we'll leave it up to you to decide if you want to dig further. The Battle of Manila was responsible for the deaths of 1,010 American soldiers, with some 5,500 more wounded. On the Japanese side, 16,500 were counted dead within Intramuros, with thousands more killed elsewhere in the city. But even in combination, these combat deaths were a fraction of the civilian casualties, as we've already mentioned. The city itself was reduced to rubble, second only to Stalingrad in the level of devastation that it received over the course of the war. The American and Filipino liberators of the city uncovered even more war crimes as they began to repair the devastation. Underground dungeons revealed a level of deliberate torture of civilians even worse than what had been done above ground, worse than the immolation of families or the bayoneting of infants. Along with them, the Americans learned of the devastating effects of their own artillery fire, with some estimates suggesting that up to 40% of the civilian deaths during the battle were due to Allied bombardment. General Yamashita would surrender to Allied forces in September 1945, and he would be executed in 1946 for his role in the battle. Hospitals were left to care for tens of thousands of wounded, while those bodies that could be found are interred as best as possible under the circumstances. The fates of many would have to go unknown, and for the survivors, the damages amounted to some 8 
$100 million in 1945, which is well over $10 billion in today's money. From a tactical perspective, the Battle of Manila provides valuable insights into the techniques of urban warfare that would later inform American and global doctrine on the subject. In the face of a deeply entrenched enemy, unwilling to surrender and bent on doing unspeakable damage to any lives they encountered, the American advance was able to proceed at a stunningly low casualty rate, with at least 17 Japanese troops dead for every one American. But even the briefest examination into why this was the case lays bare the much more solemn reality of the battle. Those relatively low American casualty rates were made up for, and they were made up for a hundredfold, by the lives of Filipino civilians caught in the crossfire. The Battle of Manila and the atrocities committed by the Imperial Japanese military during this time are not unique. The same story of urban devastation was retold in the Pacific Theater, in Western Europe, and in the most brutal fighting of the entire war in Eastern Europe. And the story of unimaginable horror perpetrated by Imperial Japan was retold in China, in South Asia, in Korea, and across the Pacific. But the Battle of Manila provides a direct confluence of those two awful factors on a scale unseen anywhere else in the war. Both sides of the war achieved a similar slaughter of civilians through conventional bombing runs, the destruction of major cities, genocide by the Axis, and the use of nuclear weapons by the Allies. But in Manila, the Allies and Axis created a sort of apocalypse all its own, a hellscape that somehow fused the worst of conventional warfare with some of the worst horrors that civilians experienced throughout the entire war. A chess game between MacArthur and Yamashita and Iwabuchi may have concluded in MacArthur's favor, but to reduce it all to a chess game at all would ignore the devastation and the death that lay in the middle.